All right, it's, it's another morning, a lovely one, of course, and uh, uh, welcome to City TV. It's the AFCON Daily Show on City TV. My name is Gabby Offer. Today is January 31, 2024, so it's the last day in the month of January, and uh, we've got, what, 11, 12 days probably to have the AFCON ending all the way in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, remember that we are heavily powered by Bet Power, and if you want to win big, big odds, everything, just sign on to Bet Power dot com dot gh you have to be 18 plus um to sign on to that and win big cash and win big things you can actually do that with just as little as one person and you're going to win a lot more because we've got a lot of games coming up uh friday that's when the quarterfinals will return um there are some other actions that you can also bet to win big it's all right uh here on betpower.com and we've got the biggest odds so just sign on to that make sure that you're just 18 plus because gaming it's addictive, so you have to be ready to cheer your team on all the way in Cote d'Ivoire. Well, my team is out of the AFCON, but we've still got a lot of countries doing big things there. Kiveda still in the Angola, Nigeria, all of that, um, doing big things in Cote d'Ivoire. So that's it for you. Um, today we've got a lot to talk about. The round of 16 is over. Um, now we know our final eight, so we'll get to talk about that. As we reviewed last night's games. Morocco, the latest uh, big hit in um, Cote d'Ivoire. After exiting World Cup semi finalists, they lost to South Africa, who are yeah, probably an underdogs at the tournaments. They kicked out Morocco um, after that 2 1 victory at the hands of the Bafana Bafana. My guests are here. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, there's a lot to unpack for you today. All right, so welcome back. My name is Gabby Offen. You're watching CTTV, it's the AFCON Daily Show. Another episode, another edition. After all the drama, after all the uh, twist and turn. Finally, we have our last eight for the African Cup of Nations. My guest are here. I've got Yao and Jamie. Uh, the ladies <laughs> call him the brightest mate. I actually call him the brightest mate. Uh, he's sitting on my far left. And in the middle, it's uh, our big man who was doing big things in Abidjan joining us today for the show. Guys, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How, are you doing? How are you doing today? Yeah, yeah. we are great. Well. Is, uh, great stuff. Um, I mean, let, let me just... <laughs> I think your initial thoughts on um, what we witnessed. Yeah, you and I were uh, watching the, uh, covering the Morocco game last night yeah. against South Africa. Um, I mean, just your initial thoughts on what you've seen in the round of 16. Um, round of 16, um, aside the Angola-Namibia game, um, which was one-sided, um, all the games have been very competitive. Um, all the games have been played at a very good pace. Mm -hmm. um, it has been equally intense. Um, it has been exciting. And, um, yeah, the goals haven't been as many as yeah. uh, we witnessed in the group stage, which is quite normal. But um, they, they have been delivered in a healthy dose, mm. and it keeps the tournament um, still um, exciting, still alive, uh, and very alive because... The, the host nation uh, managed to get through to the quarterfinal yep. um, via a very big, shocking result. And that will definitely spare them on. That will give them momentum um, heading into that quarterfinal. And that will just ginger up and spice up um, the fan base and just get their energy levels um, back to where it was uh, before uh, the, 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 the run of results that Cote d'Ivoire yeah. had um, after that opening game against... Um, um, Guinea-Bissau. And so for me, yes, the round of 16 um, games were, were on point, um, like exciting games, um, lose to um, chew on, um, mm. a lot of um, shocks in there, um, big, big results, um, the tension, yeah. uh, the officiating bit also on point. Um, yeah, I, I've loved every, every bit about it. You look at um, how um, other competitions in the world have generally struggled to deal with um, this VAR related issues, but in the Afcon, it hasn't been a problem. Mm. Uh, even um, when controversy um, potentially um, could have arisen, um, they, they dealt with, with, with those situations very well. Um, and I'll give you an example. You look at the Sadio Mane tackle, for instance, yeah. on um, Ibrahim Sangari in that game between Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire. Yeah, that should have been a straight red card, but at the end of the day, um, context matters. Um, you, you look at the context um, is, what, 12 minutes into um, the round of 16 mm -hmm. game involving a host nation and uh, one of the big, big, big favorites um, for the title. Okay. And Sadio Mane's um, first real challenge in the game 
um, one of the biggest names in, on, on the continent, mm -hmm. and you want to dish out a red car straight away, it, it just doesn't sound right. If, okay. if you Hold on for me. There's a lot to chew on. Mm -hmm. I know you've got a lot to say. I'll come to Delali in a bit. But let's start off with uh, that game at, in San Pedro, uh, the Lawrence start uh, Poku Stadium. That was, uh, it was Morocco taking on South Africa. Let's check out the highlights. All right, it's Mali true to the quarterfinals of top beating uh, Burkina Faso by two goals to one. Sinayoko, that's my man, and that team there. I mean, he's doing big things for the Malians uh, at the tournament. Uh, Delaney, let me come to you. Your initial thoughts on Mali's um, rise at the AFCON, their progression right to this stage? I think I'm not, I'm not surprised, because if you are somebody who has followed the Malian yeah. football and what they've been doing, you will not be surprised. And the kind of football they've played throughout this competition, they were one, one of the excelling teams in this tournament. And for me, I watched them play throughout the group stages. And also, mm. if you watch in the country itself, Abidjan has a lot of Malians in there. Mm. So once they are playing there, <laughs> when they won their first game, there was a point I thought it was perhaps the Ivorians have yeah. won. Because I think one of their games recorded one of the highest turnouts yes, they are very, in the group stages. Yes, they are there in their numbers. So I was not surprised. So one, they have the domestic fans behind them. Mm -hmm. And also, too, they play some excellent football that you love what they do. Yeah. And I, you watch the group stages, I think they are one of the, if you watch the round of 16, they are one of the teams that dispatched opponents with ease. Mm -hmm. They played, dominated them until the last few minutes when Burkina Faso expectedly were excelling because at that time Mali were leading 2 0, so they would relax a bit. And then Burkina Faso got a chance to come into the game. If you look at the kind of football Burkina Faso themselves played in the group stages, because Though in those groups that had all three teams in that group qualify, cl clearly tells you that they are coming from a very tough group to meet Mali, that Mali would dispatch them. In the 60th minute, they were just comfortable on the ball, just pushing the ball around. Personally, I'm excited with the kind of football they've played. But if you have watched the investment they've done in their youth football, they've been dominating West Africa's press in the youth level. So you see them in the national team and the kind of football they are playing. I'm not a bit surprised by what they've been able to do. Mm. Well, that's, that's a big one from the Malians, um, doing big things at the African Cup of Nations and uh, progressing to the quarterfinals. Yeah, um, I mean, you look at Mali, would this, you just said they are the team to tip as the dark horses in this tournament because, yeah, I mean, they're in the top 10. Um, Ghana's group for the World Cup qualifying series. Um, but you look at the talents they've got, not so much of big names in there, but I mean, they've got a decent squad that yeah. are able to do a decent job on the day. Yeah. Um, the first edition of this yeah. um, program, I tipped Mali tipped as, yeah, <laughs> as a dark horse contender um, for, for the title. And yes, they have very quality players, mm -hmm. um, but they aren't necessarily household names. I think they, are, they have players who are in the second tier yeah. um, of quality um, youngsters. Yeah. Um, they, Probably they, just rising. Yeah, they are not, let's say, your Kylian Mbappe yeah. or let's say uh, Moises Caicedo or Enzo Fernandez. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, but uh, you have them falling in that second tier because if you have Amadou Haidara in the um, RB Leipzig um, player, um, Samaseko um, also in the very, very good, um, talented players yeah. um, who do a very decent job. And um, I'm not surprised if they've, they've reached this far. Uh, I expected them to beat Burkina Faso, uh, but I was a bit disappointed with Burkina Faso's output, um, mm. especially um, to start the either half, because they considered in the what, fourth minute, yeah. third minute. Very early in the game. Very early in the game. And right after the second half um, started, they considered the second goal um, that um, Senayoko scored. And so for me, um, looking at those two situations and their general output, I was a bit disappointed with um, Burkina Faso's performance. I expected more from them, looking at um, how they qualify from a very tough group, like Delali said yeah. earlier. And, um, yeah, I expected them to be very competitive, very physical. And, yeah, they didn't really impress me. So I, I, I expected Mali to qualify. But, yeah, you look at what they had to deal with in Burkina Faso. Yeah, I expected more from Burkina. Mm. Well, uh, so that's it. To Mali, true to the quarters. Um, let's see how they fare. Uh, probably get to the finals and win it. So that would be a big achievement for them. But let's get to one other team or one other game that was played in San Pedro. It was Morocco v South Africa. And it was the last game in round of 16 to finally see uh, which of the two teams will book a ticket or will pick a ticket to the quarters. At the end of the day, it was the Bofana Bofana 
uh, picking up that ticket and, uh, I mean, guided by Hugo Bruce, who's got lots of experience when it comes to one of the coaches who have won the tournament. Let's check out the highlights. Well, Ashraf Hakimi, Charlie, I don't know what the Moroccans will be. I mean, that penalty mess, when they look at that, I think it would forever remain on the minds of them. Um, also, Sofian Amrabat seeing a red, so not looking good for the Atlas Lions. At the end of the day, it was down to Tebo Mokoena. That was a brilliant free kick to take uh, South Africa shoes to the quarterfinals. Guys, I mean, the, the conversation was always around if the pressure would be on Morocco to deliver yeah. at the African Cup of Nations. Because you look at it from the point of where they played at the World Cup, they were not favorite or then were not yeah. your big team to go yeah. on and do big things but they managed to finish fourth this time around it's a different twist you are playing at the african cup of nations you are part of the favorites you need to deliver you need to open you need to chase up teams yeah. and beat them do you think those are some of the things that haunted them yeah i think yeah obviously because first at the world cup you are an underdog so you have to it's easy to sit back defend there's no pressure on you so you can easily be comfortable and play your style and maybe watch the opponent play. So, yeah. And with that, the more the game travels away from the first minute to the closer to the 90 minutes, you get confidence because if you are playing against Portugal and it's 68 minutes and they've not beaten you, you are more comfortable playing the yeah. game. So that's it. But now at the African Cup of Nations, you are the favorites. Every game, teams expect you to detect peace. They expect you to dominate possession and play football in your style. That is a bit more difficult. And also, if you check the trend in the competition, any, at this point, mm. any big team that goes into a game is a bit scared because of the fact that the underdogs are beating them. And psychologically, it affects you as well. So if you are going into the game, you watch what happened to Senegal, who were just dominating. You mm -hmm. watch what happens to other teams. And you are going into the game against South Africa, who perhaps one of the experienced coaches in this African Cup yeah. of Nations. And when it comes to the African Cup of Nations, in as much as having good quality players works, it's one of the tournaments that a coach influence is very huge. It's key. Because if you watch all the teams that are doing well now, either they have an experienced coach or they have players. Even, it's not even about the players they have on the pitch. It's more of the experienced coaches and what they've been able to do on the African mm. continent. So, so maybe South Africa benefiting from yeah, what Obviously they are. Because if you watch all the teams that are excelling, they have coaches that have been there before or perhaps they have the local fans yeah. behind them. And Morocco, I was a bit scared for them because they have played South Africa before and they've done it. Yeah. And for South Africa, they have nothing and, to And lose. not to cut you, so after the game, I, I was just on X, also known as Twitter, and I was just picking up the tweets from the South African journalists. And the general thing I realized was that, look, there were always confidence going, going to that yeah. game, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because you look at the stats, the numbers, they've always had it it's over their yes. North African yeah. opponents. Yeah. And it was clear that in this game, because prior to this game, they met, I think, 20 months ago um, in the same group in the yeah, qualifying, qualifying series. The so they've had decent numbers against North Africans. Yeah. Yeah. But let me pick your thoughts on what Hugo Bruce is doing with South Africa. Yeah. Um, they didn't start the tournament too well. The yeah. South Africans were not too excited with the kind of display they, they put up in the yeah. first game. But you look at, as the tournament evolves, they've grown, gradually put themselves in that space yeah. of a team that can probably go on and do big things. Yeah, um, because in that first game, uh, what is different from that first game and um, this game that we just witnessed yeah. yesterday was that um, they learned from that first game, the mistakes mm. they did in that first game. So that first game, they had a penalty. Yeah. Um, at the time, it was goalless against Mali. And Pesital blew the opportunity. Yeah. Um, this time around, they didn't have too many chances, but the chances that they had, they took advantage of them against um, um, Morocco. Then you look at, um, in that game against Mali, they considered two goals, right? So that was the first goal. Yeah. The second goal, um, they tried to pass out from the back. And Mali intercepted the pass uh, with the high press. And they ended up scoring that second goal. But this time around, you look at their passing combinations um, in that game against Morocco. It was just on point. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that they were able to um, effect passes, passing sequences throughout the, the entire game. Yeah. You had players like Mokoena who, who were able to drive through um, the Moroccan lines and make it deep into the Moroccan half. And so that's what um, I, I picked out as the, the things that they did so right um, and did so different from, from their first game. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's all about um, the, those sliding um, doors situations in games. You have your chance, you take him. Yeah. Morocco had a big chance um, to equalize with Ashraf Hakimi's penalty. Yeah, and the and at the time, and at the time they, they had that penalty, they had the momentum. Yeah. And honestly, I believe had had he converted that penalty, 
they would have gone on to score at least um, two goals mm. to, to uh, pick up that, that win. But he didn't, and South Africa had a chance to, to, to cement the victory with that free kick, and Mokwena took advantage of it, and he, he scored. And for me, yeah, you have, to, you have to also look at it from this perspective that um, South Africa had as many as eight players from Sundowns yeah. in this team. Yeah, that's true. And so with a session of evidence... Who plays for Orlando Pirates? Yeah, and Persitao. And Persitao for Al Ali. Yes. A lot of players play for... Uh, yes, they play for each other for yeah. Sundowns. So, so as, as many as eight players play for Sundowns. And Sundowns has consistently been playing against um, North African sides, mm. against these Moroccan yeah. sides. So they so have a fair idea of... They have a fair idea of how to approach this game. And yeah. they weren't too scared uh, about um, taking on Morocco. Okay. Uh, so for me, yeah, it, it was down to um, they being confident and they learning from their mistakes that they committed earlier in, in the competition. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the experience of um, Hugo Bruce will definitely um, be a plus because he won the AFCON with Cameroon with this, this type of players or mm. this type of team, the kind of profile that they had. Yes. Um, Hard-working hard -working winger, one big powerful striker. Yeah. Um, Cameroon had been set up over car. Um, South Africa have... They had um, Basagog too at the time. Yes. Yeah. So Basagog, um, Persitao is playing the role of Basagog. Basagog. Um, you have evidence, Mapalo, the, yeah. the guy who scored the first Magopa. goal. Magopa. Yeah. Ma he is playing the role of um, Vincent Abubakar, mm. doing so well, working up hard, um, high up the pitch um, for South Africa. So the, the, the factors are there, the players are there to ensure that they can have a deep run um, in this competition. And mm. yeah, it was a big surprise seeing them beat uh, Morocco but at this point in time. Yeah, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they have another uh, decent run uh, in this competition. Beyond Mali, yeah, I think they are the second dark horse contenders in mm, this competition. Mm, mm. I'll come to where doing it a bit, but I mean, Morocco joined the elite countries to exit. Morocco are top of what, uh, what the African rankings heading into the competition. Uh, so what it means is that from one to five, everybody's out, you need to go home. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I just put out this tweet look. Yeah, rankings are the rankings, but the rankings don't play the football. You need to do things right to, to start. But quick one before we head to Edwin, Edwin who's got a lot for us on the touch part. Delali. I think when it comes to ranking, the African Cup of Nations basically doesn't care about rankings. It's 90 minutes on the pitch. You don't care who you are. Yeah. The team that needs it the most always goes for it. And I think that's what happens in the African, because it's been a path in where teams have teams that you expect them to dominate opponents comes into games and they struggle. Mm. And also what, makes, what also makes these top teams top teams is because of their players. And if you watch this tournament, most of the top players that you expect them to show up, I think apart from Mohamed Kudus, who were not even vintage yeah. in Ghana's game, most of the top level players, you, and also maybe your seamen in Nigeria's last yeah. game, most of the top players that you expect them to excel in this competition have basically struggled. Mm. Hakim Ziyech even didn't even... Uh, Play their last, Morocco's last yeah. game. Mention the top level athletes yeah. you want to see, and that's what the African Cup of Nations is about. You just see Vicente Abubakar in the previous edition. Nobody really expected him to score, but he's scoring. The top level, the top goal scorer is a right back who plays for a, a team. Like, you know, so yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, so it's just a right back. I mean, he's a player who's played everywhere. So that, yeah. so that's the African Cup of Nations for yeah. you. You know, the athletes you expect them to excel struggles to dominate yeah. and, and they find themselves in their top level teams so once they are struggling you don't get the best out of them and the teams that can play as a group most of the times dominate yeah. and sometimes those are not the, those, the team that come into the competition mm. as favorites they come in just to come and have fun yeah. and they slip and just go away with it <laughs> that's <laughs> great stuff to that Quick one, yeah. and that's why for me uh, when, whenever they bring up the subject of um, Africa's greatest player I never, ever, ever pick Musala as the Africa's greatest player because w when was the last time you saw Mohamed Salah boss an Afcon? Yeah, that's when was true. the last time that's, you, that's you a saw legit point. Yeah. But Samuel Leto, you saw him boss yeah. Afcon. Yeah. Um, DJ Drogba, you saw they him same, boss yeah. Afcon. And look, and to touch on um, the last point again, um, a team that does things uh, uh, very well outside its best players ends up always doing well. Mm. Look at Mali, for instance. They are getting things done without East Bissouma. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. They are getting things done without East Bissouma. Yes. They, they, they have Haidara and Koulibaly, Lasana Koulibaly, yeah. who plays for um, Salernitana. They are in, in that middle, and they are getting things done. And it happened right from the get-go in that game against South Africa. Mm. First, uh, Bissouma was starting. They weren't playing too well. Eight minutes after he got substituted and Koulibaly got introduced into the game, they started playing well. They got that second goal and iced out the game. And ever since, Bisuma has been coming off the bench. 
and look at where they are now, look at how they are playing. And so for me, yeah, it's all about how you manage things outside um, your, your, your best players play, yeah, in, in the sure. AFCON. And if your best players can turn up um, for the AFCON, oh yeah, then you definitely yeah, have, you a, have big a good advantage. run at it. Okay. Uh, you're still watching the AFCON Daily Show on CCTV. Uh, now, it's, it's just about time to break things down for you to understand what's actually happening between uh, Morocco and South Africa. And it's always the man, Edwin Kwakofi, join us, joining us with uh, Edwin. Uh, I mean, it, it was the few of us yesterday when we were yes, watching it was. and uh, producing, uh, giving the listeners the commentary of this particular game, Morocco taking on South Africa. Uh, but what have you got for us today? Look, Gabi, it was a very exciting second half. Lots of chances yeah. for Morocco and South Africa as well. But the first half uh, had uh, was very cagey, mm. was very tepid. I think the t two teams were trying to feel each other out. Yeah. So they were uh, a little hesitant in moving forward and yeah. attacking. So I think we remember that the first half, uh, both teams' XG was under it one. It was low, yeah. It that's was true. very low, yeah. under one. But there were a couple of moments in the game where both sides could have had clear cut chances if they had you know taken their time to process survey the area and okay. make a few changes to okay. their moves the first one in the first half for south africa so Moko this was south africa this for south yeah, africa in chance. the first half okay uh, mokuena obviously scored a wonderful goal in this in the second half the free kick mm. so he's definitely proficient from long range however he takes a shot from here. However, can he find anyone else in the box? Okay. If you take a look inside, inside the box, uh, let me pick red. If you take a look inside the box, there are three, two Moroccan players yeah. who are near or inside the box, apart from this player right here. So there's one here and there's one here. For South Africa, there are three options that Mokwena could aim for. One player here, one player here. One player here. Okay. So, obviously, Morocco are outnumbered in the box. One on the white side who is not being marked at all. So, could Mokwena have made a decision to cross uh, the ball into the box for any one of those teammates to attack? With Morocco outnumbered, it would have been a perfect opportunity to get a goal. Instead, he takes a shot, which isn't too bad because he does test the goalkeeper. But they are better opportunity for, for him. I think my key word, this Afcon has been good decision making. Mm. Uh, my key phrase, sorry, has been good decision making. Teams often go for the difficult uh, chances. Chances, okay. The long range shots. Instead of the glaring instead options. Instead of the, got... the obvious chances, the yeah. crosses into the box, the passes to teammates in space for higher percentage shots. And it's ten tended to affect them. So it, the problem wasn't limited to just uh, South Africa. Morocco okay. had their own problems as well. So they're on the tack with Hakimi who finds Abdi. Abdi is very, very left footed as we can see here. In this situation, <laughs> he has a nursery to in his, the box. Uh, to Just... his left. To his left. Okay. He's right here. Can he make the pass to a nursery? Obviously he can, but I think it's very dangerous. There's no uh, Chan, there's no uh, possibility or probability that it will end up yeah, with, with him. an nursery. There are so many defenders coming back. One might make the tackle. So what is the better option in this case? You take it onto your right foot yeah. and then you take the shot. He has so... Sorry. Let's go here. He has, he has so much time, so much space to put it onto his right foot and take the shot. But as we said, he is very, very left-footed, mm. very hesitant to move on to his right foot and take the shot. And as a player, you need to be able to trust yourself on the other foot in situations like that. Yeah. Unless you have a left foot like Lionel Messi, you need to train your right foot as well. Yeah. He clearly hasn't done that. He doesn't trust his right foot enough, so he stays on his left foot until he's crowded out. And then even then, he doesn't take the wow. right foot. Even when he's close to the goalkeeper, he almost tries to toe poke it with his toe poke it with his uh, left foot, as we can see here. Look, just move it for, further a little bit, and you can see that he tries to toe poke it with his left foot, mm. and then it's cleared out but, for. But, but uh, the light, yeah, so I mean, that's Adi. He came in. I think he came in for Ziyech. Yes. And that's position. Would you say is, is it down to inexperience? Because I mean, I look at Ziyech. I think 
We've, we, we don't know him for a player who, yeah, probably will take up the chances. But in that space, that moment, because should, you look at what Adi did. He made him, himself one. Should, and I'd, I wanted the video to go back a bit because I think there was a point where he could have even taken the shots okay. instead of taking, taking the ball to his right foot again because a bit back was... Yeah, so that's before he back. gets into the box. No, before, not even here. Okay, from from this side. From this side. So no, here, like, this yes, is where take it. he receives yeah. the pass from Hakimi. So so he he takes a good decision by getting he narrowing the angle, on. going into the box. Going into the box. You go again. I think at this point he needs yeah, to go he for goal. Shot, yeah. Yes. And I mean, I mean look, yes. you look at the player's posture. Yeah, because he has the ball on his left. You are left-footed. Yeah. Balance. So, we, we saw uh, in a similar position on the other side. Yeah, he should um, go for goal from here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what's his name? The Angolan striker. That's uh, 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 Mabululu. Mabululu. Mabululu, yeah. He was in a similar position, maybe the, uh, a little further out. Yeah. But he was able to angle himself and get the kill on yeah. the ball. Not every player can manage it, but you'd expect your left-footed player to be able to at least, at take least a force shot, a save. Take a shot and find, you know... A killer yeah, into yeah. this area might even decide to confuse the goalkeeper. Go for go for uh, um, close a close range yeah. or the first post shot. He didn't try any of that. Kept hold of the ball. Bad decision making. Eventually, he's crowded out by the defender and eventually the goalkeeper who approaches. Whose goal that he scored against Egypt mm. was it not in the same area? Mm. The second goal. The second goal. It, yes, was, yeah, it was, was a similar, similar thing. It was yeah. a similar, yeah, it was a similar thing. thing. He decided to he go just for the go shot. for the He got the luck end. of the deflection yes, and, and it went past yeah. Shenawi for the goal. But, I mean, those are some of the chances that cost yeah. Morocco. Because, yeah. like, like we said, like Edwin said, you look at the first half, the XG for both teams were not too good. And, like he said, both teams were a bit careful in terms of, especially in the final yeah. third, chance creation-wise, they were doing it. But that final player to put a ball at the back of the net... I, yeah. don't know. I think in the games line. like this, if I'm on the, on, on the other half and I watch opponents make chances like this, you go into momentum. And as I said earlier in my, in my submission, that the more the game travels away from the first minute, closer to the 90 minutes, it travels away from Morocco and it puts pressure on the player. So mm. now, you st if you're not careful, you struggle to make proper decisions. And once it goes in that area, uh, South Africa becomes the better team. And okay. for me, in this competition, the African Cup of Nations, one thing that you also need is your ability to convert the chances you create because the chances doesn't come as often because yeah. the game is a bit more physical, played in the midfield. So the least counter break you get, you need to make good use of it. And, and speaking of that, it reminds me about Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire. <laughs> when I watched that game, I mean, Senegal got a lot of chances. They get to the final third and they seem lost. Yeah, let me just bring you in on... on, on uh, what Morocco did. I don't know, because like I was saying, I, I, you look at Adi and you look at that space he got. He, put yeah. the, he puts the ball at the back of the net. That yeah. could change yeah, yeah. the yeah. complexion yeah. of the game. Yeah. And he had a, a, another opportunity like that um, to either swing the ball into, into, into the box yeah. or to attempt a shot with his weaker um, right foot. Because at the end of the day, um, there is enough tape yeah. for teams to game plan um, for games because you've already played three games mm -hmm. in the group stages so they know the profile of the players yeah. going into yeah. um, uh, into a round of 16 game, yeah. stage and they knew that um, Hakim Ziyech was likely not to play in this game so mm. the direct replacement will be um, I mean Adley and so they will definitely game plan for, for him, for him and yeah. they will know that um, once he gets the ball he'll move it onto his right onto his left foot mm. and so you just show him onto yeah. the, force uh, the him outside. To his right. force make, him make the angle a bit yeah, difficult. difficult for him. So yeah. you force him onto his weaker foot, which is his right foot, and force him to do something that he isn't um, um, known for yeah. or isn't comfortable with. And if he can pull it off, fine. Then you have done your job. Mm. It's just that um, the, the attacker has done a terrific job, yeah. and it's basically attack beating offense, uh, 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 offense beating um, defense. There's nothing you can do about it. There are some, some goals you can see. No matter how brilliant the goalkeeper is, he can't do anything about it. Mm. And so they, they, South Africa did their job very well. The defense did their job very well. Even um, when that channel opened up for him to give that pass to Enesri, they quickly closed it down yeah. and forced him to use um, his weaker foot. And so it was a good uh, defensive display by South Africa. And little wonder 
um, um, Rowan Williams, their goalkeeper, yeah. um, he has three clean sheets um, in this tournament. Mm. And it's down to uh, defensive plays like that. And um, Amir Adli should have done better. And um, unfortunately, he, he didn't. And mm. it's one of those situations where you, you look back yeah. And, yeah, and regret. Because... Yeah. So that uh, has cost, yeah, because has cost more had plays, yeah. some decent opportunities in that okay. first half. I don't, uh, what's next on? So, uh, is it yeah. still with Morocco? No, this time we are moving to South Africa, their okay. first goal. So in the second half, there were lots of chances. They started moving the ball a, a little quicker, uh, one touch passing. And obviously we saw, we've all seen Magropa's great finish. Over here, I think I'd like to point out a few defensive errors from Morocco in this situation. Yeah. So right here... This is Mazwari. Okay. And here is Roman Saiz. Mm. These two are in good position to take on their men. Uh, Mazwari is behind uh, the uh, South, South African attacker. So yeah. obviously he's not going to be beating or run in behind. So he's got that area covered. As the pass is played into Magopa. Watch as the pass is played into Magopa. Roman Saiz makes, makes a critical error. Of trying to play offside as a defender you do not you do not ever try to play offside mm. unless you know that your teammates are coming with you okay if you do that you risk leaving someone so behind. it should be in sync with the other players too you have to be in sync you yeah. have to be in constant communication as a defensive team he wasn't he decided to step up without <laughs> ensuring that Mazwari had done the same yeah. Mazwari played Magopa on side as you can see uh, from the line he's clearly on and Magopa has a clear running on goal. Tough task to finish, but he does it really, really well. Mm. There was a slight uh, confusion about whether he was offside, but we'll see from a uh, subsequent angle that he was right in line with Masrawi, okay. who didn't move as Roman yeah, size moved. moved. And once Roman size moves here, once he moves So that's forward, another angle of it. That's another angle. Yeah. So over here, he has him covered. He could keep up with him if yeah. the pass is played. Uh, Magopa is not the quickest player anyway. But the moment he steps out of line mm. to play that offside trap, yeah. the moment he steps up, you can tell that So you can see Mazari's hands playing... Playing him on... Magopa onside. onside, okay. So we don't have the lines here, but VAR yeah. drew the lines. We saw that he was onside. But once Sai steps up, once he gives up that extra yard, there's no way he's catching up to Magopa, who gets the shot in on goal. And South Africa have a lead that's... Uh, it will come to be very important as the game goes on. <laughs> so a very good but thing. Some, but somebody would say, do you think Bunu could have done yes. I was about to say <laughs> that. <laughs> there was no point in him coming exactly, up. Exactly, because <laughs> look, no you have Saiz covering Magopa, so yes. I think you should just stick to at your place. very acute angle. You can take it back. Can you take it back? Yes. Uh, we go back. Look. Okay. Uh -huh. And then we play it. Yes. Let's go a little further yeah. back. Yeah, so I think we come. And Before then, the ball got, gets to... Yes. yes. Yeah. Look at where he is. So the distance between. Uh -huh. Yeah. There's so much space for Bruno. And Saiz forced him out wide. Saiz was able to force him out yeah. wide. Yes. Because obviously Magopa is not the, the quickest, quickest player. Yes. But if you are Bruno, if you are taking a yeah, look at, at this, this point, you see. Yeah. You see Space. Magopa well ahead, mm -hmm. a little ahead of your defense. Are you not going to panic so, and say, make yeah, the decision so probably just to come out? react so a bit quicker. I, I, I understand why he did make the decision. Because yeah, of to space, come out. you know. But if we play it a little further on. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. At this point, why do you come out? Because if you stay <laughs> on your line, I think, I think he's he not going to beat you yeah, from yeah, that I angle. Think Edward is making a point. He has made, yeah, <laughs> he's, seen the, he's seen the damage. He's seen the, what and is coming. He so he, miss, out, he needs to come out and make, yeah. so, make so, it tighter for him. So if you come out, then you, you backtrack. Uh, no, that's you know, the worst no, that's thing a wrong for a goalkeeper no, you to do. Backtrack. You do not backtrack. Once you come out, you commit to it. Make sure that the angle is big. If you backtrack, the moment you backtrack, you make it easier. The There's no here. way you are able to uh, pinpoint where exactly in the goal you are going to be. Mm -hmm. So once you come out, you have to commit to it. Make sure the angle is big. Mm. If he starts backing up, spaces start opening. Bigger spaces start opening for the attacker to mm -hmm. take advantage of. But from that angle, from the this shot angle. he took, if let's say um, Bono was, let's say here, if he had backtracked and he had come, let's say here, he was around this spot. From the, from the shot he took, mm -hmm. from the angle he took the shot from, okay. there was no way he was going to beat Bono. 
that's my point. So, like, look, so it's it's more like Bono coming out, making the angle a bit tighter for Magopa. Mag no, for for me, he shouldn't have come out. Yeah, Roman Saiz made enough of a recovery to okay. force him out wide and make the angle very tight for him. Mm. So even if he had just come out, okay, you commit the mistake, initial mistake, yeah. but you decide to backtrack. Yeah, and that's not and, and back, back in, um, and Backtracking would have brought him somewhere here, outside his central spot in the post. It would have brought him somewhere so here. you wanted him to come Come out, here. but you made a mistake by coming out. So, okay, you've recognized your mistake, <laughs> then you backtrack. Yeah. yeah. That, and that's my whole point. The touch, the touch that so he you took. Wanted, if he was here, you wanted him in this kind of position, yeah, to stick somewhere to his here. Position, yeah. That shot is no, it's definitely no yeah. good. It's, 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 see, at this point, okay, now pause it here. Yes. So yes. let's let's watch it from this side. At this point, at this point, every yeah. every goalkeeper, every goalkeeper is, is coming out, out. But because at the distance from here to here, it's too wide. No, you see, he no, but he's got he, he gets into the box. He, before he you see the striker, if the striker touched the yeah, ball so into the box, it's too would wide. have gotten a one on one. The distance score. from here to here, it's too wide. <laughs> no, it's well, too I, wide. I, no, I can see, understand. It's too wide. I mean, Edwin, I can understand he has points. It's too wide. Because, I, I understand. Yeah, you I understand well. this here to so here? at this point, no. you felt he should have still stay on the line, stay on the line where the ball was. Yes, so but so 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 means that allow Saiz to do the covering, just stay on the line when he gets there. No, at this point, he has beaten you see. Is the South African? Let's not forget this. One, the South African touch was bad. So if he had missed the goal, mm -hmm. it would have been a bad touch from the striker. And even it made, made the angle a bit difficult. Difficult for him. Yeah. So of course, at this point, he has be, you see, mm -hmm. post it here. At this okay. point, he has beaten all the defenders. Yes. The defenders. Bunu goes forward. Once he starts tracking back, Magopa can easily take a shot. He can easily just direction. score from there. Just and it's difficult. Just put the ball in the net. Just pass it into when the they net. Are backing, mm -hmm. When they are backing back up, right. the yeah. moment, the moment. Uh, Bunu starts backing up. Magopa takes a shot and it enters no, the net. You can just pass there's it no to the, the net. Goal, yeah, there's no yeah. way the goalkeeper okay, gets so down. So you continue. You continue and let's see how, where he takes a shot. I mean, this angle? <laughs> you get it? This angle. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's this good. angle. If he has stayed here, there was no way Magopa is going to beat him. No. Well, see, so, okay. So I get your point. So it means that Bunu needs to take a large chunk of the blame. Yes, for for, me, for coming out. Two things. He came out. Um, his timing was wrong by coming out. Okay. His decision to come out was wrong. So would you not say? So probably no, that's I, down I, to I communication personally. because I think Bunu sees Saiz covering Magopa, but then decides to come out. Yeah, and no, then I it's, think it's too unsure. if you if you take it back here, yeah, this is how I feel. I yeah. feel further back. Yes, further back when he received the pass. The offside thing. No, from here. At this point. When he received the pass, yes. At this point, go again a bit, a bit further. This okay. See, at this point, he has beaten the defenders. He's beaten the defenders. That's so what the goalkeeper. He has says. beaten the defenders. Yes. It's it's more of the South, uh, the South African striker making an error that looked as if the goalkeeper made a poor decision by coming out. Mm -hmm. Assuming he took the touch and faced the goalkeeper one on one, yeah. he would have made a save. But he took a touch that took the ball away. Yes. And at that point, you can't blame the goalkeeper for, for covering the space yeah. for his centre backs. Because the centre backs were out of play. Yes. And for me, the breakdown in communication started right from um, the get go. Yeah, yeah for the pass got to Magopa. Yeah, yeah, Magopa. Because this is clearly something that they've rehearsed in training. That when you see a situation build up like that with South Africa's uh, 1 2 passing, you step up. Um, from your defensive point. Okay. And that's exactly what Saiz did. Yeah. So it's clear that Masrawi was sleeping on the job. Mm. He didn't read um the, he didn't read um the play from Saiz because they should have stepped up at instinct. But Saiz did this, the the right thing by yeah. stepping up. But I look at Masrawi where his position I think he should be able to send the danger because he has his yes he's seen, he's yeah. seen Saiz so and I he's think seen the whole Masrawi's reaction to is is not too good. It's not too good. But I mean, that's but from this angle. So it's it's where, it's, it's, where, an, it's an entire de defensive setup gone wrong. Yes, yes. and I do I, I do accept that Bunu deserves some blame. If you are coming out, you come out committed. Com you yes. do not Fool hesitate. Yeah. No, he, he he hesitated in he one came of a bit and went away. Yeah. So you, if you are coming out, you come out as quickly as you can. He didn't do that because he was in two minds. Look, he hesitates. He shuffles to his right before he ultimately takes the decision to come forward. Once he made up his mind to go forward and stuck with it, 
he's making that save. Yeah. He's narrowing the angle for Magopa. He doesn't do that. He's not committed to coming out and obviously... I mean, this, this conversation will go on and on, but I think the Moroccans themselves will look at this and I think they'll, they'll have different perspectives to, <laughs> as to how this... But like I said, it's an entire defensive setup. Gone wrong. wrong. Yes, yes, because look, I, yeah, I if you look at... I, I look at where Mazari is standing. I think if you want to be in tandem... With Saiz, yes, you need to be because you are watching Saiz, who is also looking to cover well, my That's how the Moroccans play, yeah. That's how they play, especially when they are playing against a team that they are dominating possession against. They step up and they press high mm. up the pitch and they, they leave a lot of Spaces, uh, space yeah. behind. Yeah. And that's why, um, in the lead up to the game, I pointed out that South Africa for South Africa to win this game or stand a chance of winning the game they would have to do a good job of playing out from the back, which mm. is something they didn't do against Mali. Yeah. Because Morocco pressed them high up the pitch. And they would have to do a good job of counter-attacking, not to get caught on the offside, in the offside trap. Yeah. So that's what Morocco does. Mm. And for Masrari to see the play ahead of him, yeah, and, not react. and not do the right thing by moving in sync with Roman yeah. Saiz, because Roman Saiz just reacted. He didn't think twice That's true. about stepping up. Yeah. It was some, it's something that they do in training. It's something that they do in games. Mm. I've seen it so many times. They do it in games. And not so it's down to Masrari not reading the play. I, I'm not too sure which, which game. I, I think it was it against Tanzania. Also. One, there was one game they drew. I mean, the Moroccans. Yeah, and and it was glaring. And uh, was it the that, DRC game? I think so. It was the DRC yeah. game. So I, I just told somebody that, look, this Moroccan team... It's not invincible. They've yeah, got yeah, flaws. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because well, I saw that in that game. In and the, the, the Congolese team did not take it because, yeah, you can understand that a team that hasn't probably got so much chances, they were a bit pragmatic in terms of how they wanted to do things. So they, they, they just settled for a draw. But clearly, in the knockout stage, you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to take up your chances. But Edwin, I think we need to move on to uh, so, one X, that's yes, a, this is where uh, Morocco thought they were going to get back into the game. Okay. They got a penalty. So that's the penalty? Yes, it, it came from a very good move. We saw Mokoena in the first half of South Africa. In this position, he took a shot. In this position, Morocco, Hakimi puts the ball into the back post for his teammates to put the ball across. And that is the kind of decision making that's going to get you goals. Mm. You know, in that position, you have an overload in the box. You have to take advantage of it. Make sure you hit your man. And then the ball is put back across. And Morocco gets a penalty after <laughs> Mvala. I don't know how he, what, what he was doing defensively, but yeah. he had his no, but I mean, at this he point, he would have, arms would have followed out. to score. Mm. Yeah, it was probably heading on targets. Whether Ronald Williams would have reacted quickly enough to get the save in. Or no. Was there any doubt that this was a penalty? I don't think so. No, no absolutely. No, no, no. Yeah, you, you have your arms, arms in an unnatural position. Out. Yeah, yeah, very yeah, unnatural okay. position. The ball strikes him right on the arm, and it's a penalty. Okay. Okay. Created a clear goal scoring. Clear goal scoring. And, and, and just just after yesterday, when on the show we discussed the techniques of the penalty. I mean, <laughs> it, we saw Ashraf Hakimi flapping his lines again for Morocco. Oh, one one thing we didn't talk about was the influence of other players, other players um, around, around the, the penalty box, taker. Around the penalty taker. Okay. Even before the penalty is taken. And we don't get to see it here, but South Africa employed a very good strategy. Mm. Try and distract uh, Hakimi as much as possible. Wow. Stand in front of the ball, uh, goalkeeper comes out, players come out, uh, try and put him off as much as possible. You never know, you could get into the player's head and then he, he's going to miss it. And as this was a high pressure penalty, Obviously, Hakimi definitely had something in his head, decided to go straight and high, which is the perfect penalty. Yeah. Only thing is, he didn't keep it low okay. enough. He didn't get lucky. It's a high reward penalty because goalkeepers hardly ever save shots that high. Yeah. And goalkeepers hardly ever stand straight. Yeah, stay in, in that goal. position. And stay in that yeah. position. But when you do so, you have to keep it down. High risk, high reward. And Hakimi obviously missed it. So, so, so before y'all come, yeah, yeah. so that's two chances gone begging. Yeah. The one from Adli and this, and you see, if Morocco converted these chances, yeah. it means that they this, would have this a in game. particular. Exactly, the penalty would have changed the entirety of the game, and then Hakimi just especially with mind. six minutes left in the <laughs> you game. You don't do that. <laughs> yes, and well, if you could go back to that Hakimi, the replay of the penalty, the replay, let's, yeah, let's, no, the yeah. penalty kick. 
the penalty kick. Um, it's from Hakim. Just close to the end. Just close to the end. Okay. You we'll, see. We'll get um, there yeah, you see him as soon as he makes, he kicks the ball. You see a bit of turf also come off. Yeah. Because okay. he he does yes. Yeah. So you're saying okay. So yes, he a bit of turf. He picks up the. Yeah. He, because I think he went a little bit too under the under ball. The ball. Yeah. So that's what uh, took the ball a bit too high and, and it clipped off the crossbar. Yeah. Because normally, yes. you see, see the, the bit of turf that, of that comes off the, yeah. the, the, the pitch. Yeah, yeah. So it's more like he's trying to dink it. Yes, he, he dug a little bit too low. Yeah. He dug a little bit too low and that's what skied more like, the more ball. More like he's taking a cross instead of a penalty. Yes, he, that's why he skied the ball and it ended up uh, clipping the crossbar. Other than that, it would have... Rifle straight underneath the, the crossbar mm. into the top corner of the net. But he went a little bit um, too low so, and he just took the ball high. Yeah, so, so that's a good point you've raised. So technique-wise, Edwin, yes. and he's, he's mentioned that technique. Because you look at the way he tried to kick the ball. Everything was on point up until that point. So usually you see, what you see players do is when they put the ball down, they step around the penalty yeah. spots to ensure that the ground is level okay, okay. so that there is no chance of them kicking anything other than the ball itself. Mm. Usually it works this time. It didn't for Hakimi and he lifts it over. But I like the reaction of the his players. Over. The way they quickly, they yeah, quickly yeah, yeah, yeah. picked him yeah. up. Picked yeah. him up and told yeah. him it's not over yet. I mean, but they themselves it, it, are a little bit at fault. When the penalty was initially given, you could tell that the players were already celebrating even yes. before the, yes. the penalty had been taken. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but when you, you get a penalty not, at this point... No, no, you do not do that. Yeah. You, <laughs> you need to bury it before. <laughs> yes, it puts mm. way too much pressure, pressure on, on the, the penalty taker yeah. as well. Knowing that his teammates are already celebrating a goal that they think will be instead of one that's an imaginary, might be. An imaginary. But I have this strange uh, uh, theory. I think the striker should have followed up just kick the ball into the net to get a goal. No, it, when it hit the crossbar yeah, and went, went No, 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 not no. Like yeah, when the ball initial, touched the, oh, the initial, they, for the penalty. Because when he, when the ball touched the South African defender's arm, the ball just fell. So you're saying he should have followed up. Yeah, ball. just put the ball in the net yeah. and they would but take no, a goal. You see, the thing was, as soon as they realized the ball took a touch. They stopped play. playing and, yeah, and so, that's my problem and with them. See, there was one player who just here. rushed. Just go and just touch the ball into the net. Yeah. And then he, he raised his hand, the penalty. Well, I think he did actually follow up. He did follow up. He actually he went up, towards stopped. the ball. You see? Once he saw that it was, it was running a on the angle, it was on the angle, that's when they decided to just uh, ask for penalty. the penalty from the referee, swamp the referee. But then he, anyway. Well, I mean, so two well, chances one begging for, for Morocco. And like I said, especially like y'all said, if Hakimi converted that penalty, yeah. The storyline would have been different. But, I mean, you don't do that at the knockout stage. You need to yeah. make things, should I say, perfect. If, yeah, you can, if we are playing football, if we are... Doing I understand football, you, yeah. You can't be perfect. You can't be perfect. You can't be perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you just need to take advantage of, of your it. opportunities. Yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. be perfect. Um, you look at uh, Ivy Coast, for instance, Cote d'Ivoire, for instance. Yeah. They weren't perfect. They, weren't they were perfect, far from perfect. Just, okay. They were far and from perfect. And they needed that um, late save in extra time for Fofana, their goalkeeper, to prevent yeah. Sadio Mane from getting that goal. So, yeah, you don't need to be perfect. You just need to um, ensure that when the timing, is, uh, the timing is right, you get it done. Execute it. You execute. Okay. And you unfortunately for Morocco, they didn't. You just need to take your moments. And, 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 and in football, you don't do ifs. <laughs> if yeah. the Black Star defended a bit better, I wouldn't have if. been home. If. So you can't yeah. do if in football. You just if. have to... If Hope. Richard O'Fray didn't and touch that ball. This is what I've... This is what I've... Yeah, you, know, you can't do yeah, Richard this, this is what I've, when when it's gone, it's this is what I've realized with the AFCON here. So, when you watch the group stage matches mm -hmm. and you watch the matches in the round of 16, one thing I've realized that is very different from what I saw in, in the group stages, you, 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 you find teams who are very all out. Yeah. They come in, all, all guns blazing, throw every, a lot of players out front. But in the round of 16, like Edwin said, especially with this game, the first half, the XG was really low. So you can tell that both teams were, were not playing to score. a bit laid back, yeah. trying to see, okay, what have you got up your sleeves? If it doesn't work, second half, you go. Because we saw all the action in the second half yeah. from this game in particular. The Equatorial Guinea versus Guinea, it yes. was a similar mm -hmm. thing. The first half was a bit boring. boring. The second half, yeah, it changed a bit. Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, same. I mean... And, and, and it's, I think it's also because you don't really get enough data on the, the players that play in, the, in those games. So... Coaches tend to use the first 15 minutes, the first 45 minutes to, to have a fair idea of the opponent, the opponent okay. and also know their strengths and their weaknesses. And that's why 
substitutions are always important. Because if you watch the Ivorians game, for instance, all the players that had impact on their team, on the game, was players that came off, came the, off bench. the bench. Yes. And the AFCON has always been like that. If you can have players that can walk into their team and make changes, if mm. you have a coach who can read your opponent. Because the African football is in a way that you don't get enough data on African players. Yeah. You don't get enough data on the opponents you are going to play. Yeah. You only know them based on the matches they've played in the yes. group stages. Yeah. And sometimes, coaches even play based on the opponents they are going to play. So yeah. you don't know the kind of team that will, will show up mm. when you are going to face them. So you just have to use the first 15 minutes. So you, just, you can't go all out. So you have to give at least the respect to the opponent also because it's a knockout game. Yeah. You go all out. You get scored, someone goes sit at the back and you I can't even score. Okay, yeah, coaching, let me, no, coaching yeah, hold on, let me just come yeah. to Edwin. Uh, mm. If you have just something final for us, then we just uh, go for a quick break and then come yeah, back. Yeah, a couple of things really yeah. quickly. There was a really strange situation uh, in, the, in the game. So this is the no, free kicks. Okay. Yeah. Amrabat, yeah, okay. A really uh, strange situation where Amrabat was sent off second yellow card, but then the referee checked VAR, called Amrabat back. Uh, rescinded the yellow card yeah. and gave him a straight <laughs> straight straight card. Card. Some people are wondering why, why is, is so? that very okay. important? Had he got a second yellow card, he misses two games for Morocco. Mm. Because he, he gets a straight red card, he misses three games yeah. now, which means he gets to miss a few World Cup qualifiers, yeah. which puts the Morocco's op op opponents uh, in a bit, at a bit of an advantage a for very tight situation. Puts Morocco at a uh, disadvantage, obviously. So that's it. Just to clarify that. And finally, South Africa's second goal. Oh, boy. How it came about. Wonderful Se free kick. Moko ena. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful free yeah, kick. Yeah, expertly taken. But could Bono have done better? Could Bono have done better? Mm. Let's take a look at it. From here, it looks like a brilliant free kick. From the second angle, I'd like to point something really quickly out to our viewers. So. It's, it's a long way out. Mokwena definitely has the quality to take the, the shot, the effort. But Bono is in a good position to make that save. And he unfortunately doesn't. Look, he, okay. right here, you can see it. So you're checking his steps? His steps. Okay. Just if he can't even see the ball. He can't even see the ball. But yeah. that's, that's be, uh, so that's the, the wall not, to, not doing him too much. <laughs> the wall itself has its own problems. <laughs> but <laughs> we'll, we'll focus on Bono, the goalkeeper. He takes a step to the right and then he hesitates before taking extra steps, even though he's seen that the ball is heading this way. Usually the goalkeeper takes a step just to uh, uh, check if where the ball yeah, is heading, which from. direction is heading, and then they take extra steps into that direction. Once he takes the first step, he hesitates and then takes another step, hesitates before actually moving to the right-hand side to make the save, which meant he didn't have enough time yeah. to get to the That's ball too late before for uh, it's put in. So maybe you could put Bono at fault, but that's still a wonderful free kick yeah. from Mokwena. I mean, this, this game had everything. It had a drama, it had a twist and turns. Um, so South Africa finally making it through to the quarterfinals. It's a big, big win for, for the Bafana Bafana. Let's see how they fare in the last A's. You're still watching the AFCON Daily Show on City TV, heavily uh, sponsored by Bet Power. You can do big things with them by just placing just a little amount to win big, 500% win bonus. And uh, make sure you're just 18 plus because gaming is addictive. Uh, Yao here won big yesterday with uh, I mean South Africa when they do big things against Morocco. So you want to follow in that path. Um, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, there's a lot more for you. All right, so welcome back. This uh, is the Afcon Daily Show on CTTV. My name is Gabby of uh, I'm doing this with uh, our partners, uh, Bet Power. Uh, they are helping us to do this really big for you all the way right from when the Afcon started. And uh, they're still holding us on to February 11 and doing big things with us. You have to sign on to betpower.com.jh to win big, 500% uh, win bonus for all the things you, you want to stake. Um, we've just start down with uh, Morocco's big win against South Africa. But let's check out the results from the round of 16 and uh, have a fair idea of which teams have made it to the last eight. It started all the way. The last eight will actually start. The quarterfinals will start on Friday. So there you have it. Um, it started with Angola. They beat Namibia by three goals to zero. Uh, Nigeria, their three-time champions, also beat Cameroon. And there's a whole lot of stories emerging from Cameroon. We'll get to talk about that a bit later. Kutura Guinea also lost to uh, Guinea. 
Egypt were kicked out by DR Congo. That game had to travel to penalties. Kivet, uh, Ghana's group, they are all the way in the quarterfinal. It's the second time Kivet are getting into the quarterfinals. The first time they did so was in, was in 2013. And uh, they went on to lose to uh, Ghana by two goals to zero. It was down to Mubarak Waka, so this time they are true. So let's see how they first. Senegal, the defending champions, kicked out by host nation Ivory Coast. Mali are uh, true after beating Burkina Faso. Morocco, World Cup semi-finalists, kicked out by South Africa by two goals to zero. So yesterday's games at Mali and Burkina Faso and Morocco and South Africa as the two games to wrap up the round of 16 and now we're heading into the quarterfinal so if you want to combine the goals you've not seen too much it's just the angola game against namibia that had three goals uh on one side on one side i want to put it and uh, i mean yeah just like you said in terms of the numbers is it okay Oh, for this stage, it's, it's more than okay. Okay. It's, for this stage, it's more than okay. You're impressed okay. with what you've seen? Yeah, I've been impressed with what I've seen. We had a lot of goals in the group stage, 89. Yeah. Um, and when you put it in context, um, the 2019 edition had 100 goals scored yeah. throughout the yeah. entire edition. The entire then, had 100. 100. Yeah. Then the 2021 edition, the entire edition had 102 goals. Uh, but for this edition, at the end of the group stage, you had 89 goals scored. Mm. And so... We are looking at the number of goals that we've had so far in the round of 16. When you add that to that tally, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty sure we are over the 100. It would increase. Yeah, it would, it would definitely increase. Or if we are not um, up to 100, yeah, it would definitely be very yeah. close to 100. And so for me, yeah, the goals have flowed in at a steady rate. And yeah, we shouldn't expect it to um, keep up with the pace that we had mm. uh, in the group stage. I think, but uh, we've yeah. got 17 goals in the round of 16. 17. Mm. So 17, 17 okay, plus so 17. 89, that's yeah. what... So that would be... One, I think, 106? Yes, 106. Yeah. 106, one, yeah, yeah, 106. 106. Yeah, that would be 106. So, yeah, we've, we've already passed the, the tally, the goal yeah. tally in the 2019 and the 2021 yeah. edition. So, yeah, it's good for the it's tournament. Good. Yeah, it's good. It's good. You always want to have a situation where uh, football games have a lot of goals in there. Yeah. Mm. Especially mm. when they've always said African football doesn't produce, produce goals. a lot it's of goals. Yeah, yeah, we are yeah, just kicking yeah. And that conversation China. resurfaced again in the group stage when um, uh, Ivory Coast played Guinea Bissau. Yeah, the conversation again about how because again, you look at Ivory Coast had a lot of chances. Yeah, like People thought that they could have had a lot more goals. Yeah. yeah. And and I think so. If you go into an Afcon where you get to see teams score more goals, then you know that a lot of good things are happening. And for me, I think this Afcon, we all know, it has been an exciting one. Mm. As a new tribe, you are someone who just love football. Yeah, you've enjoyed yeah, much. You've enjoyed yeah. much. And the thing is, um, the lady mentioned coaching, and coaching has played a key role in how in teams have performed. Yeah. Because you look at Ivory Coast for. Cote d'Ivoire, why do I keep saying it? Cote d'Ivoire, for instance. Uh, <laughs> the first game, yeah, they had no problems beating Guinea-Bissau because yeah. Guinea-Bissau, they didn't offer much of a challenge. But the second game, they lost to Nigeria. And their third game, they lost to uh, Equatorial Equator by yeah. four goals to zero. Yeah. Then they got lucky and they qualified to the round of 16. But the coach made a very big change by dropping Frank Casey yeah. Yeah. And, bringing, and starting uh, Jean-Michel Seri. Mm. And that changed the entire dynamic of... Of that game. Of, of that game. Yeah. Because when you have Seku Fofana, he is all action, covering every uh, blade of grass on the yeah, pitch. box He's to box. everywhere, yeah. box to box. Then you have Ibrahim Sangari, who is a less uh, mobile version of Seku Fofana. Mm. And when you have Frankese also in the mix. Yeah, that's too rigid. That's, that's pretty much um, Flat the same it. profile yeah. of players yeah. that you've lined up in the middle. That's true. But with John Michel Seri, he will sit deep. He isn't going anywhere. Yeah. He will just sit deep and protect the back for as long as possible. Knowing very well that you have Serge Aurier, who is always willing to attack. Mm -hmm. And so once you have uh, John Seri, Michel Seri in there, willing to sit deep, he's always ready to drift towards the right yeah, side cover to space. cover up um, the space that is, is yeah. left behind by okay. uh, Serge Aurier when he advances upfield. And so that was very key. And we've, I've already touched on um, Erichel, uh, who is the, uh, the head coach for Mali. Yeah. The kind of um, decision that he made that has really got Mali playing very well. Yeah, they are benefiting from Bissouma. what he's done. Yeah. How many coaches um, would have the balls to drop a guy like Ish Bissouma, mm. looking at the kind of form that um, he has and playing for Tottenham Hotspur yeah. and playing and, and starting a guy like Lasana Koulibaly yeah. ahead of, of him. Yeah. And that has been very key. Um, to the success of Mali so far. And mm -hmm. uh, for Cote d'Ivoire, yeah, that change also was very um, key. <laughs>
Well, <laughs> it's out of Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, I mean, they're, they're saying that, look, um, probably they'll be that country to do what Portugal did at the 2016 Euros when it finished then. Had a whole lot of um, stories not going to a, uh, too much for them, but they managed to win the, the tournament. Yeah, it's, they are the host nation. They've got the numbers, they've got the people backing them, but the football must be. But let's check out the uh, last eight, the countries who have made it to the quarterfinals, and uh, hopefully they can uh, book a place in the semis. Yeah, so there you have it. It will start on Friday. That's when the quarterfinals will start. Uh, so, yes. It's Nigeria taking on Angola. Uh, that game should be nice. Nigeria three-time champions. The last time they won it was in 2013. And they are looking to win it for the fourth time. Charlie, let me say then, they are tied with Ghana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for whatever it happens, Nigeria can win. This is what we draw here. Yeah. Uh, is up against <laughs> South Africa. Uh, South Africa have got a manager who's won it before with Cameroon. So they've got the experience there. So, I mean, it should be nice. The quarterfinals should be nice. Um, the game I'm looking forward to watch is Mali taking on Cote d'Ivoire. Yeah, That's the game you need to keep tabs on. Look, it's going to be fireworks. Let's see how the Ivorians, would they be able to pass another test against a very resolute Malian side? Whoever, uh, wins, whoever wins, wins that game yes. will go to the final. Yes, yes, yes exactly. Whoever wins that game will get to the final. Go to the final. Well, let's that see. DRC, Guinea, uh, Hardy Fair. And then the last and game uh, is uh, DR yes. Congo taking on Guinea. Yeah, so that's your final eight for you. So the path... Is there for you the yeah. final? Um, we'll see the, f the final two countries to play and win the 34th edition of the African Cup of Nations. It's looking really good. You can also join in the conversation, uh, share your thoughts on what you think. Who, who do you think will get to the semi final stage? Who do you think will win the tournament? Who do you think will finally pick up the seven million dollars put on by the Confederation of African Football? But guys, let me start off with Dalali. Um, Let's start off with uh, the Nigeria Angola game. Nigeria have gradually grown in this tournament under uh, Jose Pesciero. He's also one coach who is under so much pressure. Yeah. The Nigerians are not too excited. I said that when, ever since he took up the job, he said, hello, he needs to be doing better with the crop of players he's got. Yeah, obviously. And he's not, he, he's not got Angola to play. Obviously, I think for, and, and from the start of the competition, if you talk to the Nigerian journalists around, they were all not confident in what their coach would do. Yeah. Because they, they've always believed that they have enough quality. Because if you have these kind of players in your team, you always have to dispatch no, Not to cut you. So I saw this, I saw this funny thing of how... Uh, so that was... A, a, they had a front, a very good-looking um, attacking outlet. <laughs> Midfield is okay. Defense, not too no, good. No, not too good. And, and I think uh, uh, Jose Pesero talked about it in one yeah. of the uh, pre-match press conference where he said, yes, he admits that... Uh, the team has a strength, which yeah. is the attack. This is the attack. And it's normal. Every team, every country or every football club, there are some points in your team where you see that you have dominance, that you are excelling there. Mm. But it's, it's up to him as a coach to create a balance. And I think their captain, uh, Ahmed Musa, also yeah. said that they believe that, yes, it's true that they have the best player on the African continent, but also they believe that at the back end, the goalkeeping, for instance, because prior to this tournament, they had goalkeeping challenges yeah. and for them they know that they they always said that they have other players in the team that are good in as much as the fans think they are not good enough so there was pressure on the coach mm. they were not expecting their team to excel but i think in competitions like this every team most of the teams that excel in competitions needs one game that reminds them yeah or switch them on switch them on okay. i think at the world cup it was that Braz it was that argentina's first yeah. game it's, it made them realize when that they lost, they can't sleep when they lost their first game yeah. and i think in um, nigeria it was the draw that they had in their first game mm. when the fans expected them to just dispatch the opponent and they were just all over the place they were down came back to equalize and they were very bad on that day mm. and i think that game made them realize that no come on we can't we can't go to sleep and for them they had they were lucky that they got their bad game a bit early. And I've always said that in competitions also, you need one bad game. You can't just be vintage. Senegal were just vintage in yeah. the group stages. And when their bad game came at the wrong time, because yeah. when your bad game comes at the knockout phases, yeah, you are just going them. home. Yeah, so for Nigeria, their first game really helped them. They had a very decent run. Mm. And, now they, and also, that victory against the host country, when even the host country themselves thought that this is a game that we should just win. Because yeah. prior to that game, Nigeria had drew and Ivory Coast had won their first game. So the confidence were in the, the odds and everything were in the favor of the, the Ivorians. But they managed, but Nigeria managed to win. And mm -hmm. after that, I think they've been 
they found their system because it was a matter of how they would be able to score goals yeah. and defend better. Because scoring the goals has never been a challenge because okay. they've always been like that. It was more of finding a better system mm. that maximizes their strength, which is moving forward, and also reduces their weakness, which is defending. And I think the three back system has now really it's helping. Them. I was just yeah, about yes, yeah, yeah, the three back yeah. system is. But I think them. he's realized that look, I've not got a good defense. Yeah. Let me just set up in a way that won't expose the defense I've got. Yeah, yeah that's, what's our, that that's what's black stars for. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I've always, yeah, you've, you've I've always, always advocated, advocated <laughs> for a three-back system yeah. for the black Not stars. to expose the cause. Yeah, um, that's what's our, head. And I've always said, that's what the, uh, your head coach feel to do. <laughs> yes, because our full-backs aren't really full-backs. Yeah. They're not defenders. Instance, they're not defenders, thank you. Yeah. For instance, um, Gideon Mason. If you play him as a fullback, yeah. you won't get the you best out him. of him. Yeah, yeah. You get the best out of him when he's played as a wing back. Yeah. And that's what um, Pissero has done. Has done. He noticed that I don't have Wilfred Ndidi in this team. And Onyeka is not a Wilfred Ndidi. He's not that Who can cover spaces. Yeah. He's not a brilliant defensive midfielder yeah. who can hold down that position on his own. Um, uh, Yusuf, who, is, uh, who was more or less the replacement for... Um, uh, uh, indeed, the late call up. He's also not built up for that position yet. Yeah. He plays for Real Antwerp. He's a very young, young chap, um, Alas and Yusuf. He's not built like up to that point yet. So throw him into that yeah, position. Yeah, and, and I think not to cut you, the coach at one of the uh, press conferences mentioned said, it. Yeah, mentioned he said that yes, it's always honest that the player that replaces the one that gets injured. It's not on the same level. level. Yes. So I think, and what I like about Pessoa is his honesty. Yeah. Yeah. He always understands his team and, and knows the right decisions and what to see. And I think that's what And in that first game, um, their formation was a 4-1-4-1 four, one, four, one formation. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't work out too well. He changed it. And he changed it. And he switched to 3-4-2-1-3-4-3. Three, four, three, four, three because he realized that Franco Nyeka needs a bit of help in that midfield um, position. Mm. But he also recognized that I have a very um, good fleet of defenders. Ajayi, um, Tosin Adarabio, yeah. I have um, Trust Ekon, and yeah. I have Calvin Bassi. So I can line them up in a three-defensive um, uh, man formation, a three-man defensive formation, because Calvin Bassi is left-footed. Yeah. Um, Adarabio can pass out from the back. Trust Ekon is Just, that bullish. Yeah, he yeah. can play out on the right side. And I have uh, a guy who is... Um, ambidextrous in Ola Aina. Yeah. He can play on either side. Yeah. And he does so well as a wing back rather than as a full back. Yeah. And I have Sanusi on the left side. That's true. Who also does so well. So why don't I just play a three man back uh, system? Yeah. To get the best the, out of To get the best out of them yeah. and have uh, wing backs and give Onyeka enough support by getting um, Iwobi mm. to withdraw from that um, position where he plays in a two man position behind Osimen, like yeah. they did in that game against Equatorial Guinea, 4-1-4-1 four, one, four, one formation. So he, he dropped him a bit deeper mm -hmm. to pair with um, Onyeka. So you have two men in the middle, two, um, one man on the, um, the right wing-back yeah. position, yeah. one man on the left uh, wing-back position. Then you paired um, Lukman and um, uh, Osimen up, up top front, yeah. with, with the likes of um, um, I forgot his name. Um, Adimola, Luk uh, yeah, Adimola Lukman, Lukman yeah. and um, Osimen up top. Then you are done. You're That's done. what you need to do. Yeah. And but for me, uh, yeah, for the, 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 again, coaching. Coaching also so it's comes down to coaching, yeah. Don't, switch, don't switch to Black in. Stars, please. Yes, not switch to Black Stars. Okay, yes, let's, let's, let's move on to the conversation. Now, they are playing an Angolan side that have got a very good coach, yeah. Pedro Goncalves. Let's yeah. not forget that this same Angolan team, we faced them in the group. Mm -hmm. and they managed to qualify. Uh, they have, they've also grown into the game yeah. very well. Mm -hmm. And you look at the team, they are very disciplined. I mean, yeah, what should these Nigerians expect from Angola? Um, a lot of energy, a lot of um, physicality, okay. um, and a, a team that has the right mentality. Mm. Um, because this team has gone through a lot um, to get to this point. And this is a team that had its um, highest profile player in Mbola and Zola. Um, decide to drop out of the team yeah. because he said he wanted to focus on his club career and yeah, uh, playing for um, Fiorentina. And you also had two players also leave the team because they weren't getting playing time. Yeah. And, so, and, and, this, and then discipline too. And so they've overcome a lot um, to get to this point, uh, to get to 
the quarterfinal. Yeah. They don't go to the quarterfinal that many times. Yeah. The last time they went to the quarterfinal, I believe, was in 2010 when they, yeah. they hosted a competition. Yeah. And Ghana ended up beating them. Um, Ketsi, uh, Asamoja, linking up with Kujua Samo, yeah. that wonderful goal. And so they've overcome a lot to get to this point. So they have that right mentality. They are very physical. They are hardworking. And Nigeria would have to be wary of those treats. Nigeria has the quality. Mm. They just don't um, have to be complacent. Okay. Once they avoid complacency, uh, play out a good game plan, which I, I know at this point, Pesero is he has that confidence. Yeah. He has that confidence um, to lay out a very good game plan. As long as Nigeria stick to that game plan and not get complacent, I think they should be fine and sh should be able to qualify mm. um, to the semi final. So Nigeria to progress? Yes, Nigeria to Nigeria to progress? I had to say, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to you want to shy away from predicting that is of course. I, mean, right. the the, I, I just wish I just wish Nigeria doesn't beat Angola, because uh, it, but if you check the teams in this that are left, if there's any team that lacks the character to face Nigeria, maybe to a bit frustrated, they might think Angola because of the manager they have, very mm. disciplinarian. Who yeah, it's pretty much a no nonsense man. And for Nigerian, if I I watch Nigeria's opening game and. If you can get them distracted, you can easily get into the team mm. and get a decent resource. It's going to be a difficult one. But I think this Nigerian team is beatable. I, I don't want them to... Because if they beat Angola, they are winning the AFCON. Yeah. Unless they beat the, they meet the host nation. And they, I, don't Nigeria beat, I don't think so. Uh, Angola, I don't, I don't, not so. No, no so. <laughs> no, so you know. no, I think, think it's... it's, it's I think it's, they will beat Angola yeah. and get to the semi-final. Because I think when they get to the semi it's if going they, to be really difficult. If they get them. to the semi-final and they meet Cape Verde, yeah. that's when I know, oh yeah, they'll get to the final. But if they meet South Africa, that's a different ball game. Mm -hmm. If they miss South Africa, that's a different ball game. That's why I wouldn't be so quick to say, oh, no, but if they can Nigeria get beats Angola, they'll go no, to the final. Because yeah. personally, uh, if, if, if you ask me a team that can beat Nigeria and you put South African... Uh, and, and, and Angola, I would pick Angola because you pick of, Angola because of over South Africa because of mentality. The South Africans they've always been that a team that sometimes they lack the mentality when you need them the most, and the Nigerians have that. Mm. So Angola is one of the team that can match them on mentality level. Because when it comes to quality on the pitch, you can never have it ahead of the, the Nigerians. Okay. So sometimes what you need is the mentality, and I think the Angolans have that in them. Because if you watch them, the group stages, they were very disciplined. Mm. They meet the opponents, they go past you. They, they are not scared of playing also. And that's what I think Nigeria would need. But for South Africa, I think, yeah, they, they have been excellent, but they, they never saw themselves beating Morocco. And I think in as much as they've beaten Morocco, if they are not careful, it will also be their downfall. They would be overly excited. They would also feel they've overachieved because yeah. ideally, they didn't even really make it to the 2021 okay. African well, Cup of Nations. Sure. So, Let's see how them it. games that I wish yeah. that Nigeria don't win, but they'll just end up winning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the guys here, I mean, you can understand why they are really <laughs> back in terms of why yeah, stuck is neck out to say that yeah, yeah, for Nigeria. Nigeria do Nigeria. win this. Uh, let's see how Nigeria fit. That game is on late on Friday. Um, uh, it's 5 p.m. at the Stad Felix Ufe Boanyan Stadium in Abidjan. So let's see how they feel. Uh, the next game will be late on that day at 8 p.m. is DR Congo taking on Guinea. And uh, I, that's, that's, yeah, that's, I think that's, that should be good. I think that game is going to be one of the blue. Yeah, Congo looking to, I, to, to chase, looking for a third half trophy, though. Yeah, I think that game will be very boring. I it think will be that boring? Game will be boring. Yeah, I think that game will be Because you, you think that these two teams are. Uh, the deal with yeah. it, very pragmatic in the way. Kind of. Yeah. And very, very, very aggressive um, with their physical, the yeah. physical side of their game. Um, we should see a lot of yellow cards. We should see a, maybe a couple of red cards. Um, we should see a game that doesn't flow. Mm. Um, and that's why I see, yeah, this game not to be a very entertaining one. Uh, but I still will go out there to uh, pick the Congo to qualify. Um, because I think they do just enough to create decent opportunities, yeah. um, either via penalties, via set pieces, uh, via corner kicks. And they tend to feed their front men a bit better than Guinea. I was so appalled with Guinea's approach um, against Equatorial Guinea. Mm -hmm. When they, for some strange reason, they were doing everything not to get the ball to the feet of um, Seiju Gurasi. Yeah. Why would you want not game plan to get the ball to one of the best finishers in, in the Bundesliga? Mm -hmm. They were doing different things. And they were, doing, and yeah. they were always Flipping having players yeah. 
um, do what um, I mean Adley did uh, against South Africa, where there's a chance to cross the ball into the box for um, Jurassic to, to attack. Mm -hmm. And for some strange reason, they will attempt a shot or they will check the ball back infield and the chance will be lost. I, I just couldn't understand why they, 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 they consistently did that. And I think they got a bit lucky um, uh, getting that win over Equatorial Guinea because it's where did everything right with that penalty kick, uh, except he just finding the back of the net. And they got a bit sloppy at the back, and yeah, Bayo ended up heading that ball into the net. Yeah. And for, for DR Congo, I think they have just enough quality. Um, they, they match... Um, Guinea's uh, physical yeah, physicality. So two teams who are and, evenly split. Yeah, and they, their work rate is also on point. So for me, looking at um, this this game, I think uh, DR Congo gets the advantage because of the quality of players that they have. But I don't expect it to be a game that we'll remember for a long time. But I, I, I just... just so, um, I mean, okay, so if I'm to get it, it means it's one of those games that can travel into extra time. I wouldn't be surprised if it does. And penalties. Yeah. Easily, because... I, and also... If, this competition, DR Congo are yet to get a win, a win yeah. in, in open play. Almost, almost all the games. Because almost all the games, they are yeah. very defensive. They hold up, sit back, try. Even against Egypt, they were in similar fashion. Yeah. In as much as they managed to get a goal. All, although because Egypt also were very, very bad in this competition. For Guinea, they've been a bit expansive. And you can also blame them when they play against Equatorial Guinea. Because nobody in this competition will go against Equatorial Guinea and open up. Because they've been they've beaten the host country by so many goals. Like, they've been one of the excelling teams. Apart from, I think, apart from Senegal. Mm. They've been one of the exciting teams in the group stages. So, if you are playing them in the round of 60 and you are Guinea, obviously, you need to put yourself in that. I think it's a game that both, both countries have nothing to lose. Mm. I think they would, they would go up and uh, look at themselves and say there's a chance to make history. And that's what will make it more compact. Yeah. Because the fact that we know that a slight performance can take us up there, I will not be surprised if it travels to the extra time because both teams don't really score goals. Yeah. Guinea, them, Ecuador, Guinea themselves don't. Uh, DR Congo themselves don't. However, if Guinea manages to score, they would win the game. Mm. Whoever manages to get the, the first early goal, goal, first goal, ends up winning the game. And I think that's what Guinea, that may be their game plan. Looking at the fact that DR Congo themselves have struggled to score goals in this competition, have struggled to even defend chances. Mm. So if they manage to open up a bit and get an early goal in favor of Guinea, they might win the game. Yeah, I, I, okay. I, just a, I don't on, think yeah. it will be a big problem if um, Congo concedes the first goal. Um, because we've seen them concede against Morocco, and yeah. they came back, they and, came back yeah. and they drew. Yeah. Uh, and, and they've been able to do that against Morocco. I don't think um, they'll have any issues doing that against Guinea. Um, so for me, yeah, I'll, I'll go with the Congo win. And I, I see this game playing out the way um, it played out between Guinea and I, I believe Burkina Faso in yeah. the group stage. Very, very physical, very, very boring. Had a lot of yellow cards in there. Not too, um, not too many exciting moments in that game. Yeah, that's how I see this game. But at, at the end of the day, I see the Congo qualify. Then they will lose to either the winner of Cote d'Ivoire <laughs> and Mali. Why uh, are they going to lose? Yeah, yeah. Well, because I mean, the quality from that yeah, end that, of the, the bracket, next, Okay, uh, it's, I progress. understand. So, uh, you yeah, are tipping DR Congo to progress. Uh, the lady, yeah, DR Congo to yeah, also yeah, progress. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's hear from you what you think about the last eight, which teams will make it to. Um, the semis and which teams will drop. Uh, you're still watching the AFCON Daily Show. My guests are Yahweh Jeminta and Delali Frank. My name is Gabby Ofe. Uh, let me take you to Boakke now because it will be that game that I'm looking forward to. Uh, Mali Ivory Coast. Quick one, guys. Um, I, I mean, the Ivorians have everything in terms of uh, the drama, in terms of the emotional torture. <laughs> I want to put it. You sack your coach and only to rely on Morocco. So when um, and then you are, you, you are able to go to, to the next stage. Now, you come up against the, the defending champions. You kick them out. You are coming up against the Dark Horses of Mali. What are we to expect from these two countries? Quick one. It's Let me start a, off with the Lali. I think it's going to be a tough game, you know, because Ivory Coast themselves, maybe they are now growing into the competition because they, they, were, they didn't have a very good start in yeah. the group stages. But once they've been able to beat Senegal, they will go into this game and say, come on, if we've been able to beat Senegal, who is Mali? Yeah. But the Malians themselves have played some good football. And I think the country will divide into two. Because even when 
um, even when uh, the Ivory Coast were playing their game, the Malians were just hoping that they don't win. They were basically on their neck not for them to win because of the number of uh, Malians also in the country. So it's going to be, the country is going to be divided into two. But I think the home fans should be able to help help the Ivorians to, to get a decent result mm. because of uh, the kind of performance they showed, the spirit they, they played with. And I think in this moment, that's what maybe you will need. And also maybe Mali themselves will look at it and say, maybe we've also overachieved, but for them, they look at the game against, uh, uh, against Ivory Coast yeah. and they look at it and say, maybe we can beat the host country <laughs> and go out the way. That's a big finals. deal for them. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, let's let, talk to me about MS Faye, who's the, um, in charge of the Ivorians after they had to sack Jean-Louis Garcia. Yeah. Uh, is there pressure on him to deliver? Or you think that, no, there's no pressure on him. He just needs to get his players out there yeah. and put up a good display that will take them to the semis. No, there's no pressure on him. I okay. mean, he came to um, do the, the mop-up, okay. more or less. Yeah. And he didn't he, start the work? In the yeah, house, yeah. He, he didn't start the campaign. Mm. He, he just came in to stand in for um, the, the sack coach. Yeah. And he managed to get them pretty much the biggest results um, in, the, in the competition. Mm. And so if they lose, at the end of the day, there's no pressure on him. Yeah. Because he was expected to get kicked out of the competition um, at the hands of um, Senegal. And he, he ended up getting his team to do the virtually impossible. And so there's no pressure on him. He's, he's, he's more than done his job. Mm. There's no pressure on him. And so if they go out and they lose... There's no pressure. If they go out and they qualify, yeah, then there's, there, he adds um, a bit of um, shininess, a bit of shine. To what um, he's to done, his to resume. his CV, yeah. Okay, yeah, to his resume. A bit of shine to his resume. Because at the end of the day, he wasn't expected to get this team um, to, to get to go this now. far. Yeah. And if they manage to get to the semifinal, for a team that looked emotionally out, mentally out, for, for, them, for him to be able to get this team to deliver that shock that he said... Um, in his presser yeah. before the Senegal game, for him to be able to deliver that shock, to get that team to play the way they played against Senegal, played with a lot of purpose, <laughs> played the right way, attacked Senegal. They didn't sit back um, for, uh, for, for extensive periods in the game, and they managed to keep on digging, going at it, even after falling um, behind mm. early in the game. Yeah, yeah for, for him to be able to get his team to play that way, uh, yeah, I think um, he deserves a lot of... Um, um, applause, yeah. and should they fall short of making it to the semi-final? No, it's, it's, it's it fine with you. It shouldn't feel that, any, it's fine with any uh, So if, if, if you are part of the federation, you look at the job he's done, you say, okay, yeah, I mean, we didn't give you the job at the start. No, uh, I don't you think managed to, one to game, kick out. I think the yeah. sample size is too small. No, just okay. one game. No. And, and, and also about the pressure, I think there's pressure on him. You think, you, yes. so you think that there's pressure and, on and him? And I'm going to explain why I think there's pressure on him. First of all, in, in football context, there's no pressure. Like, there shouldn't be a pressure on him. And I think the pressure will not come from the Federation. Because the Federation then, so they know that they are out of their place. Because once you sack your coach in the middle of the tournament, the fact that you're going to look for Heavy Renault to come and help you, that clearly means that you okay. don't know what you're doing at that point. Okay. But the citizens, from the start of the competition, they want to win. And they don't care who is in charge. If they put you in charge of that team, they will, be they will put pressure on you. And that's what happened. Even mm. when they went to play against Senegal, in as much as they thought Senegal were a better team, they were expecting the team to win. Okay. And that's what is going to happen to him. There's pressure. He knows it. He knows that there's pressure on him to win. Mm. But no matter what happens, he will look at himself and say that he will be proud of it. But okay. for pressure, but I start for Mali. Quick one. Start for Mali. It might just end up being another case where they, they are bound for success. And some way, somehow... They fall short. Yeah, I think that's that's has that, always been Mali's that's always story. Been Mali's issue. Yeah, okay. that has always we always look at them and feel like they will we, do well, but sure. We need to pro uh, move on um, the conversation. Uh, we'll probably touch on so I have Ivory Coast to to call yeah, Cote d'Ivoire to, yeah, to, yeah. to, yeah. to go through. Yeah, Cote d'Ivoire to go through. Yeah, Cote d'Ivoire. They have to go through for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is what we'll do. We'll take a quick break. Uh, when we come, there's a lot more. We're zoning into the Black Stars camp. Uh, they're out of the tournament. Yeah, everybody knows about that. But the Black Stars are still. Uh, on the lips of Ghanaians. Why? We'll tell you more when we back after this break. All right, so you're still watching the Afcon Daily Show on CCTV. My name is Gabby Ofer. Doing this with Yao AJ Menta and Delali Frank. We've talked a whole lot about uh, the games in the round of 16. We now know our final eight, and uh, this show is brought to you by Bet Power. You can do big things with Bet Power. You just have to be 18 plus. Sign on to betpower.com.gh and uh, 
uh, do a lot of big things by just placing a little amount on the games that you're watching and uh, just make sure that notice that gaming is really addictive. But um, let's move on to the second part of our show and it's about the Black Stars and joining me to, to do this is uh, Jerome Autry on Zoom. Um, a lot of the Black Stars are out, but the the budget for the Black Stars is, 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 is all over there. I mean, it's an alleged figure that, is that we are yet to hear from the Ministry of Youth and Sports. Um, the minister needs to give us a breakdown of uh, what the 8.6 was used for um, the Afcon in Cote d'Ivoire. Remember that the prize money for this year's edition is uh, $7 million, and that's uh, an increment by the Confederation of African Football. According to them, it's just to increase the prestige of the tournament. Guys, let me start off with you, Delali. Um, I mean, so prior to the tournament, we had the ministry's youth, um, the, the ministry's PRO come out to say that the baggage will be out after the AFCON, and it didn't make sense to a lot of people. Um, some of Kujutua Blackwa Honorable put out some figures that people are not too excited about those figures, most especially with, because of the performance of the team in the last um, four editions of the African Cup of Nations. We keep pumping in money, but there's nothing really to show. I, I, I don't know what you think about the conversation so far. Yes, I think uh, if you see your national team spend that amount of money and uh, get knocked out of the group stages, like basically not spend, but if you, if you see the budget, that's the budget. It, whether they spent it or not, we don't know. But to see that you budgeted such an amount of money for a tournament that you got knocked out of the group stage is like we are angry already. So definitely any amount we see, we are not pretty much going to be happy with it. So I think just as every Ghanaian, we are also going to react the same way because in plenary, we all look at it and say, nah, come on, like, what are we going to do at the AFCON? Because mm -hmm. it's just that because that we're going to spend this kind of money, I think maybe the ministry basically really needs to come out and come and explain to us their plans. But if you honestly watch our budget for the African Cup of Nations, I think there are so many things that makes it go high too much. Mm. We, as a country, we need to, there are so many things that we do during tournaments that we need to look at it and bring it down. Because first of all, I, I think, think that we can slash some of the things yes, we are doing. I, I don't think the eight million is only for the footballing reasons. When I mean footballing reasons, you mean yeah. like on the, on the players. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that 8 million covers only the players. I don't, I don't think it will get to that point. And those are the things we need to start doing. We need to start cutting them. And you'll be surprised that most of them on the budget or the, thing, the expenses that we're going to do are things that we've been doing ever since we've been qualifying for the African Cup of Nations. For example, funding uh, funds to go and watch games giving them per diem. These are practices that will always push your budget so high. But it's a practice that we've been doing. You come to government and you don't want to do it and everybody will come after you. So we need to come together as a country and look at how we can slash a lot of things on our, on our expenditure. And also, I think you could clearly tell that the fact that we also wanted to come in South Africa, South Africa also perhaps influence on high, high that budget is going to be. And for me, the fact that we are not, we didn't go to South Africa and we stayed in Ghana, the ministry also has to come and ex like, yeah. let us know how much we saved out of that amount mm -hmm. and the fact that we didn't also make it out of the group stages, that how we plan on spending the money. And that's how we can slash some of these things. Yeah. How we plan on... And that's a really an interesting point you phrase, especially with the campaign one, and then failing to progress out of the group. So it, may, it means that if these two things happen, Especially with the campaign and progressing, <laughs> we would have seen something more higher. Maybe the, I don't think the no, eight million no, is. It covers, it covers yeah, the eight million like, is not what the eight million is, is not their expenditure. Mm -hmm. It's more of budget. So budget. We're thinking of okay, what if we make it all, all the, the way, way to, to the, the finals, finals and yeah. win yes. the tournament? So that is what okay. Yes, yeah. but uh, now that we didn't, mm -hmm. we have to know that we did okay we didn't spend this we didn't spend this so out of the eight million we spent this let's say, back. one million or we spent two million okay um uh, we've got Jerome Murphy joining us um on the line to talk more about this but let's look at Ghana spending from um the Afcon I mean right up to now we've got uh, these figures we put out 
uh, we put together for you to check. Um, yes, yeah, so there's, yeah, it's from 2013, 2015, 2017, 2019, 2021, the last um, AFCON in Cameroon, and then the current one that is happening all the way in 2013. Uh, let me speak to Jerome. Hi, Jerome, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, and good afternoon to you and your guests. Uh, good afternoon to you too, Jerome. How are you doing, first of all? Yeah, by God's grace, I'm fine. I, I believe uh, you're also well. We are good here. Well, Jerome, I mean, the Black Stars is, is, is out of the competition. Um, not the one everybody... I, I don't know your, 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 your thoughts on the, the teams, how they fare. I mean, the Black Stars, how they fare. We'll get into the figures in a bit. But, I mean, your general thoughts on what you witnessed in, in Cote d'Ivoire? Well, it was nothing surprising, nothing so shocking, because what you put in is what you get. What we got from Cote d'Ivoire is as a result of what we put into Cote d'Ivoire. And if you believe in the theory of uh, Gigo, garbage in, garbage out, then you shouldn't be too surprised. Because Ghana didn't plan to excel at the AFCON. We didn't prepare to excel at the AFCON. I'm not even sure exactly what our targets were as we were going to Ivory Coast. Yes, there is always the general assumption that nobody goes into battle thinking that he's going to be defeated. But we always know those who go to competitions of this nature well prepared. And that's why we're able to tell that these are the likely teams to win the competition, even though this particular competition, it looks like all the bookmakers uh, are getting it wrong. But whatever Ghana did in Ivory Coast, I was not surprised at all. And uh, maybe we'll go into why I'm not surprised, but I don't think I expected anything different from what what we did I, I have to say however that i had the hope that we would change the script but when the competition started especially after our second game i was more than convinced that it wasn't going to go well okay jerome now so the way forward for the team i mean the gfa yesterday put out a statement um apologizing and uh, uh giving us what they plan to do in relation to the team. Before that statement, we had a, a five-member uh, committee put together by the Ghana Football Association. Now, people have raised concerns about the kind of people who are heading this committee to find Hilton's successor, and they think that the process has been rushed. We are not solving the other issues confronting the team. And as a repetition of something that has happened, I mean, with what we did with Milovan, the performance wasn't good, put up a committee, there's a coach being announced, and then we neglect the other factors. I mean, your thoughts on all of this? Well, I, I don't believe the problems of the Black Stars is, is to do with coaching. The reason Black Stars have been poor in the last two outcomes is not because they've, they've not had a good coach. It is because we have mismanaged the team, and we continue to mismanage the team and the expectation of the public. So if we appoint a new coach by whatever means, whether it's going to be recommendation of a committee or whether they're going to headhunt, I don't think it will change anything. What must change is the various practices that we seem to have become comfortable with when it comes to managing our national teams. And until those practices, some of which I think are very bad, change, we are going to see a continuous decline of our senior national team. Let us not forget, before the current FA came to power, the Black Stars had consistently, maybe with the exception of uh, 20, 2017, mm -hmm. had consistently made it gone or made it past the one one uh, uh, the one eighth stage, which yeah. is the quarterfinal stage. Yeah. We had a consistent appearance in the semifinals about four or five. We have been in the finals on two occasions in the last uh, 13 or 14 years. And if in the last four years, or let's say two years, we have gone to the point where we cannot even win a game at the AFCON, 
I don't think it is something to do with coaching. It's got something to do with what the management of the team is doing in terms of not being able to keep a coach over, let's say, two or more years. In terms of uh, player selection, some of which have been very questionable. In terms of even the budget of the team, which it's always uh, riddled with controversy and the public gets, gets to know of it. it. It kills their confidence or trust in the team and everything that the managers of the team is doing. And that creates a sort of disconnect such that Black Stars are playing and you have people who wish that they lose because once they win, those leading the team are going to earn monies that they've not worked for. So these are some of the factors that I believe have contributed to affecting the fortunes of the team. And not until we tackle these issues head on, even bringing the best of coaches like Pep Guardiola mm -hmm. to the Black Stars, we'll still have the Black Stars being poor because we are not tackling the fundamental issues of management around the team. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting that you raised that point that even if we bring in Pep, uh, we we'll still struggle because that's the exact same way as uh, former sports minister Neil Ante van der Poel. But, John, let's, let's, let's go through the figures the Black Stars um, has spent ever since, like, for, for tournaments. Um, you look at, at the AFCON, interesting figures have popped out um, after uh, the Black Stars exited again. Um, 8.5 million. Uh, budgeted for this year's edition. The prize money for this year is, is at 7 million, but you look at it all the way from 2013, 2015, 2017, 2019, 2021. Uh, let's start with the 2013. The prize money at the time was 1.5 million. Our budget for the tournament was 5.8. So it means that we've always had, apart from 2021, where the budget and the prize money was in, uh, in line, we've always had and 2017, that was a bit lower than the prize money. Our budget have, is, is always higher than the prize money itself of the tournament. Yeah, I think we have to educate our viewers that the nature of the AFCON, I mean, participating in a competition like the AFCON is such that you are always going to have your, uh, is it, I don't even want to talk about budget, yeah. but then you are always going to have expense or expenditure uh, going beyond the, the price, price money itself. Because if you take, for instance, yes, if you take, for instance, the AFCON 2013 in South Africa, the prize money as shown on your screen was $1.5 million. Yeah. At that time, I don't know how much air tickets were, but assuming we're taking 22 players plus a technical team and maybe one or two management officials, we're going to pay uh, something closer to, uh, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So by the time you leave the competition, you would have spent, if not close to that amount, maybe more than that amount. I, I think that it is not even fair for us to do a comparative analysis of how much we budget for a competition and how much we are likely to get if we are champions of that competition. Mm -hmm. Because we are, except perhaps for the World Cup, we are always going to have that imbalance if we are talking about the Afghan. So that's one point I want to make. The, the, the second issue for me is, is it conscionable that we spend that much? You forget about the budget. I mean, budget is not anything. It's just a projection of what we are likely to spend. Yeah. But we have seen some of the expenditure. I mean, I have seen some of the expenditure. And... I look at how much we spend on the competition and what we do at the competition. And it tells me that we are not doing the right things. And that is why Ghanaians will talk. Ghanaians are not talking because they, they think that money is being spent on the team. Mm. No. Once the team moves, once the team plays, we are always going to spend money on them. Okay. But how conscionable is the expenditure on the team? The, the, the quantum of money we are spending on the team, how justifiable is it? And I think that is where the conversation should be taken to. And from what I have seen, these are not things we can justify because we are doing these things for the Black Stars at the detriment of other national teams who are not being paid. Mm. We are doing these things at the detriment of national team coaches, who some of who are still being 
old. So how do you show that on one senior marketing when other team coaches also uh, owned by the state are not paid? As we speak, the black queens are old. Yeah. I mean, their, their bonuses for qualifying for the uh, Women's African Cup of Nations have not been paid. They have a game in about two weeks against Zambia, which is a crucial Olympic Games qualifier. Mm -hmm. Now, if they've gone three or so matches without their bonuses being paid, and these black queens players wake up in the morning and see that for the black stars alone, in so I mean, a little over $8 million were budgeted for their competition. How do you think those players will feel? Yeah. And you would hear the excuse that, oh, there's no money paid. There's no money to the queens. If there's no money to the queens, how are we able to raise millions of dollars for the black stars? So there are management issues that coach cannot solve. It is always going to come down to the government of the land, the minister in charge of sports, and the FA. Take, for instance, the black princess. I, I don't think their bonuses have been determined. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have been paid. Even though they have qualified for the work, they're going to participate this year in Colombia also. Yeah, so Columbia. the picture of painting is that if we have enough to spend on the Black Stars and we are not spending on the other national teams and they virtually have to beg for their bonuses, then something is wrong with the way we are managing the game. And that is a point of concern for me. Mm. Huge one. So, I mean, it brings me to the point that uh, you look at the team's performance and the money we've pumped in, it's, it's not in line. And you think, so what do you think are some of the things we can do to, to slash some of the things of in terms of high, having higher budgets for tournaments for the Black Stars? We, we have to look at the entire of national team football in the country. What is it that we want to do with national team football? When I was growing up, uh, the Black Stars was a, a, a rallying point. I mean, we use the Black Stars as a tool to unite the nation so that some 14 years ago at the World Cup, not just Ghana, yeah. but the rest of Africa rooted behind Ghana. I mean, to see Ghana excelling at the World Cup in South Africa. Mm. So it was a rallying force for, for all of us. So if we say we are using the national team to foster national unity. And today people are divided over even supporting that national team. Then something is fundamentally wrong. So the first thing we need to do is to establish what we want to do with the national team. Okay. If it's about national unity, then, then there shouldn't be divisions. There shouldn't be bitterness or bickering mm -hmm. over money. People are complaining because they believe that taxpayers' money are not being put to, to, to proper use. So let us establish what we want to do with the national or the other national teams and be clear in mind that this is the path we want to go. Okay. So, for instance, if today we don't have a coach and the ARU on record told the parliamentary probe committee of 2021, I mean, during that AFCON probe, yeah. they said in clear terms that coaching has been the issue, coaching is an issue. He thinks that inconsistencies in coaching is a problem for the Black Stars. Mm -hmm. We must play that even if we're setting up a committee to appoint a new coach, then we should be clear how long that coach will stay in office. Even if results are going the way we want, we should have a reasonable expectation mm -hmm. and tell ourselves that maybe in a year or two, we will not get the right results. But we allow him to go, let's say, a second, third, fourth year. We will see the kind of results we want to see. I was telling someone this afternoon that if you take the South African coach, when he started, it was very... Uh, okay, um, we seem to have lost uh, Jerome Oshry there. But a really, really interesting point he's raised in regards to uh, Ghana's budget for the African Cup of Nations. And uh, I mean, let me just come to you. Uh, I mean, he's raised a, raised a lot of... He was just about giving us some things we need to, yeah. to do to slash off and have a reasonable budgets we can take to the AFCON, and he made mention that, look, you look at the performance, we keep on pumping money mm -hmm. into the Black Stars, but yet, performance-wise, we are not delivering. Um, yeah, I, he made some very... Okay, um, yeah, hold points. on, I think we've, we have Jerome back. Hi, Jerome, can you hear me? Hi, Jerome. 
Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, I can so hear you. So you were making a point before the line dropped. Yeah. So, so I was saying that if you take South Africa, for example, in 2021, they were not at the AFCON. Yeah. In fact, they, 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 their, their coach, who they appointed in 2021, if you calculate from that period to this point, is in his third year. Mm. I don't remember the last time last task coach spent three years <laughs> or got into his third year in Ghana. Yeah. And these are these are fundamental issues of management. If you cannot have consistency in the way you are doing your things, consistent results will be very difficult. Mm. The results are going to be inconsistent. And that's why at the last AFCON, we couldn't win the game. And this AFCON, we, we drew two games and lost one. I mean, that is also inconsistent, even if you are comparing it to our last performance. Yeah. So all I'm saying is, we should be clear on what we want to do with our national team. If it is management, if it is coaching, if it is investment, what are we doing specifically that is bringing all of us together behind the national team so they get the kind of results that we want to see when they go to international competitions? Mm. Interesting points. And finally, before I let you go, you mentioned that the black queens who have qualified for the WAFCON, the black princesses themselves, are being owed some bonuses. I mean, <laughs> if you want to look at the black stars, the money that they pumped in, we still need to settle these this players and, and get them in, in tune for the tournament they have to play, Jerome. Exactly, exactly. And there's a clear imbalance. I would love to see the budget they will make for, for the Women's African Cup of Nations concerning the black wins. Yeah. And we compare it to the black stars. Yes, I mean, I know very well that the two competitions are not the same, even in terms of prominence or prestige. Yeah. But if we can make money readily available for the black stars, and we cannot pay the bonuses of the black queens, then there's a clear, there's a clear unfairness or a, a, a clear case of imbalance in the way we are doing things. And it doesn't appeal to me that we, we seem to be very serious about national team football in the country. Recently, I think somewhere last year or so, the U.S. female national team have been fighting for equal pay. Mm. Yes, someone might say that, oh, that's far-fetched. I mean, that's Ghana is not yet there. I agree. We may not be there. But if at this moment we are talking about millions of investments in the Black Stars and we are not seeing the kind of results we want to see and other things are not being given the, the, the same or let's see a, a fraction of attention of what the Black Stars is having, then it clearly tells you that we are not going to see the kind of results we want to see. And I would want leadership of our the Football Association, and especially the sports ministry, to, to, to take critical look at the way they've done things in the past. Because clearly, we are not getting the results. Yeah. So something has to change with the way they are doing things. Coaches yeah. have come and gone. If a new coach is appointed in, let's say, three weeks for the Black Stars, he will be the fifth coach in five years. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if, if we keep changing coaches and we are not getting the kind of results we want to get, what it then means is that there's something in Nigeria which are not doing right. And we will need to fix that part as well. All right. Uh, thank you so, so much, Jerome. Interesting points uh, and uh, you've raised there. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. You were, we're making a point. Uh, just a quick one and then we, are, we wrap up for today. Yeah. Um, I think with the Black Stars, um, the, the problems are multifaceted. It, it can't just be the coaching. Mm. It can't just be management. It can't just be government. It can't just be um, sports ministry. Because at every point um, in time, when you look at these factors, um, there is an argument to be made for, for them. There's an argument to be made for against them. And so I think once you bring all those factors together, mm -hmm. then you have the positives okay. and the negatives. So that's where you, you need to take away the negatives and focus on the positives. Mm -hmm. So for instance, coaching. You need to bring in the right coach. For instance, Chris Hutton, he made a mistake by starting Connex Doffa yeah. as a creative midfielder in our game against Cape Verde. Connex Doffa is not a creative midfielder. Okay. He's played throughout this season for Hamburg as a right winger. You don't play him as a creative midfielder. Yeah. That's a coaching issue. issue okay. So, for instance, government, you don't fly people to um, a, a tournament mm. and give them money, whereas you, you don't de deliver money or you don't give money to be provided for the, the, the coaches for the uh, juvenile teams. You don't do that. Mm. So those are the negative things that need to avoid, okay. and those are the positive things that 
um, need to be encouraged in terms of their investment to the black stars. They are pumping a lot of money, mm -hmm. but they are doing things that aren't necessary, uh, that aren't necessary for them to pump money into. Okay. So those are the things that they need to avoid, but the right things that we need to encourage. That's, mm -hmm. I think once we do those things, we'll be fine. Well, I mean, let's, let's see how um, the Black Stars, in terms of who next to take over the job, and that, because, look, they've got the World Cup qualifiers to play. Um, the football is not looking too good. And that's how we wrap up today's edition of the AFCON Daily Show on CTTV. Many, many thanks, uh, Yao Jeminta and Delali Frank. You had Jerome Motri also joining us earlier on. My name is Gabby Ofer. The show was probably brought to you by Beck Power. Uh, we're back same time tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day.